of the crisis. Whether you can still call it a crisis if it goes on for four or five years, I don't know. But I think more or less these are the most familiar terms. But then I want to talk a little bit, slightly speculatively, uh, because no actual analysis has been done yet that I can find about the likely impacts of these, now I've put four Fs, food, fuel, financial, and fiscal crises on the MDGs. I think there's a direct link between the impacts on, on what I'm calling care, uh, and you can draw a direct line between care and the MDGs. And I want to talk a little bit about what we need to watch out for going forward in the next few years. I think it's particularly interesting to be talking about this in Indonesia, where the MDGs have taken on quite an important policy dimension, and what happens after 2015, the president is very, is very involved, is taking a real lead on this. So I think in terms of keeping an eye on the impacts of the crisis on the post-2015 setup is quite an interesting thing to do. And then I want to tell you a little bit about the new research that we're doing um, in this in this area, and uh, two two projects in particular, as Mary are working with us on both of them, I'm very pleased to say. <laughs> well, we hope so, the contracts are still being signed. <laughs> <laughs> so the background to this really is that um, sometime early in 2009, Britain was hosting the, uh, the G20 meeting in April of that year, and this was round about the time when, just after Lehman Brothers collapsed, and Everyone was throwing their hands up in horror and going, oh, terrible crisis, there's a food crisis, there's a fuel crisis, and now there's a global financial crisis. And DFID, part of the British International Development, the UK aid agency, essentially approached my team and said to us, can you very quickly go and do some participatory work and find out what's going on? How are people experiencing these things? And they said, you've got about 10 weeks because you need to deliver this by April. So we said, yeah, no problem. And off we went and managed to find uh, colleagues in, in Smeru who could do the work in Indonesia. Everyone was very keen to know what was happening in Indonesia because of the 1998 crisis and the fact that Indonesia had set up a number of social protection schemes in the wake of that. People were very keen to see how would Indonesia cope this time. Uh, and some other countries were also included in that first round of research. In the end, we ended up doing uh, community level research in eight countries, uh, Bangladesh, Indonesia, Kenya, Yemen, Zambia, Jamaica, uh, England, and Northern Ireland. I won't talk about England and Northern Ireland because it's, it's not entirely relevant, uh, but it was very interesting. Um, and in four of those countries, in Bangladesh, Indonesia, Kenya, and Zambia, we did repeat rounds of research. We went back at least once a year to see what was going as the crisis unfolded. 2009 was one kind of crisis. 2010 was a very different kind of crisis. And 2011, it was really a return of the food price spikes, as it was known. Food prices hit you know, global high historic climb in 2011 in a lot of countries. So we went, we did the three rounds of research, um, and the research was very, was very modestly focused on, we weren't trying to understand everything, we wanted to understand how everyday life was being affected, how everyday <coughs> patterns of, 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 of life were, were being affected by these crises. Um, and this seemed to us an important thing to do because this was the way uh, we thought of understanding the impact on poverty and on social, social life, social relations and so on. Um, not yet, just to show you. These are some of the outputs from that work <coughs> over the last three years. Um, one, some of them you can find on my webpage on the IDS website. Uh, the one in the middle I think is very cool because it's a, uh, a, you can download it for your iPhone or your iPad. I just think that's great and it's free. That's growing a better future. Um, that was our 2011 report. And the one on the on your right, the orange one, Living Through Crises, is a book that came out earlier this year with the World Bank, which is also available online for free. You can read the whole thing. Um, unfortunately, that doesn't have an Indonesia case study in it uh, for various reasons, but the, the overall analysis does draw on the Indonesia um, research. So certainly Indonesia is in there in the overall framing of the book. Um, the approach that we took to social impacts monitoring, as we called it, was quick time. We had to do this very quickly. It needed to be very close to the ground so that policymakers could have a sense of what was actually going on uh, at that time. And so when we delivered our report for the G20 in April of 2009, it was based on you know, 
what was going on in these countries four or five weeks previously. Uh, it really was very, very quick. Uh, this is compared to your average sample survey, which will take you at the very, very least six months to, uh, to produce, and more, very likely much more to design, collect the data, clean, process, analyze, etc., etc. So this is very quick. And, and we thought about these sites as community listening posts. We, these were places we would go to hear what people were saying about how they were experiencing the crisis. Um, and as I said earlier, we've been revisiting these places. We learned from something called the reality checks. I don't know if anyone here is familiar with the reality checks approach. Uh, the reality checks are uh, the kind of immersions where researchers go and spend some time in villages to have a look at different kinds of policies and programs on the ground. So in Indonesia, this reality checks approach has been used uh, in, for, to look at education programs. It's a very participatory approach, and it gives a real reality, you know, to to what is going on. You know, government says X, Y, Z is being spent. These are our new programs, but actually, is anyone seeing it on the ground? This gives you a real sense of that. So we, we borrowed from that approach, and we looked not only at the very poorest people. Uh, but we looked at groups and communities and, and, and sectors where people were really exposed to the global financial crisis. So in Indonesia, we went to Bekasi to the export sector, the industrial complex uh, there, to talk to workers in the export sector. Um, and the approach was, as I said, very positive, very participatory, very small in scale. This is not a. This doesn't give you any kind of representative sense of what's going on in terms of the crisis across the whole country. We tried later to integrate that with some more representative data. Very much we focused on the social impacts. How were people experiencing this? How were relationships being affected? How was everyday life being affected? Um, these, these are the sorts of things that we felt were generally neglected by doing more usual survey analysis work. And we've learned a lot over the last few years, I think. We know that there are quite serious limitations to work on the scale, two communities only in each country. When we first, when we first went to uh, do this research, somebody who was quite a famous researcher in Indonesia said to us, so in, in Indonesia with, I don't know how many thousands of languages and ethnic groups and islands, there are hundreds, he said, there are hundreds of thousands, and you're going to go to two communities? And we said, yes, we are, because we just couldn't go to many more. But what is interesting for me about this is that the, um, the, what we have learned and the way we've managed to analyze this data, it has had some, to my surprise, some quite impressive predictive power about how things are shaping up for people. So from one or two good interviews done in the class, we could get a sense of the patterns of change in global export manufacturing, uh, labor relations, so people would say the pressures on us are getting harder, um, <coughs> Minimum wage may have gone up, but the benefits are declining. Later on, so we were the first people to be saying that this was going on in the wake of the crisis. Later on, data were coming out from Cambodia, from Vietnam, from Thailand, and other places saying the same. But this was, you know, from the very early discussions we were having on the ground, this is what we were hearing, this is what we were telling policymakers, these are the things you need to watch out for. Similarly, uh, we're hearing today on the news about the food crisis in Yemen. I mean, two years ago when we were in the field in Yemen, we were saying to policymakers then, this is an absolute disaster of a situation. People are really, uh, not only hungry, they're also really angry. You have to take action. And it took some time, but today, you, you hear about the situation in Yemen, it is, it is like the Horn of Africa. Um, so although there's no representativeness, we realize it has, it has, it has some explanatory power for what's going on. The key messages that came out of this work, and, and I'm, I'm taking this, this slide in particular from um, a World Bank policy research working paper that came out uh, earlier this year, or maybe it was last year, which is in that book, um, Living Through Crisis as well. And uh, my colleague Rasmus Helfer has described it as an anatomy of coping, really trying to get into the bare bones of what it's like to be living through crisis, to cope through crisis. And I think the the big, the big message is that yes, people do cope and people do adapt, but this is not a costless activity. This does cost. It has development implications. It has implications ultimately for uh, development outcomes for the MDGs and so on. 
And one of the key things that we found across context, this is work that was done in 17 different countries, quite a lot of qualitative data were collected. We think probably more qualitative data from more locations on this topic than has ever been synthesized before. So we think this is incredibly robust. Uh, but we think the costs of coping tend to be unmeasured because unpaid care work, and I'll talk a bit about what I mean by that in a minute, but unpaid care work tend to be, tends to absorb these costs. Unpaid care work doesn't get measured. Nobody, nobody counts how much time is spent on cooking or collecting water or looking after sick people in the household. Nobody looks at that. NGOs, we found, actually did very little. And we hear a lot of talk, especially in Africa and South Asia, about NGOs. Actually, very little support was found on the ground by NGOs. NGOs are mostly closing down programs, not starting off programs with the crisis here, because they themselves, their budgets were also hit by the crisis. Similarly, and here Indonesia is different from the other countries, but the government social protection schemes were generally very low in coverage, uh, didn't work very well in many cases, uh, which were often felt to be unfair. They had a lot of problems. There were some exceptions, like school feeding programs were generally very highly regarded, but on the whole, state social protection coverage was pretty poor. But the very important sources of support were these informal sources of support, customary sources of support. It was your neighbor, your family member, your friend, the mosque or the church or the pagoda, or these sort, sorts of uh, types of assistance really helped people. However, as the crisis, particularly the food crisis, got severe, these sources of support became less and less viable. There was less and less capacity to help when there were more and more people needing help. Overall, we've heard a lot in recent years about resilience. We've heard that people were very resilient, countries were very resilient. And we think, yes, th this is true. We could see this on the ground. But actually, a lot of the time this resilience was masking some important hidden costs, which I think are very much to do with the impact on care. I'm going to talk a little bit about what we mean by care now. Um, this is what we used to call, for some, for some reason we stopped talking about it. When I first entered development about 20 years ago, we used to talk about these things. We used to talk about the double burden or the triple burden on women. We used to talk about domestic work. Uh, we used to talk about the reproductive sector. But we stopped talking about it for about 15 or so years. And we talked a lot about paid work. We talked about microfinance. And women's empowerment meant women going out to work. But now we're beginning to see again, partly perhaps because of the crisis, I think, to, see, to think again about the unpaid work that actually is what well-being is all about, what, what everyday life is all about. Um, and I got this, um, this little uh, formula for you from some, somebody called Debbie Budland who does a lot of work on gender budgets. Um, it is all the stuff you think it is. It's housework, it's all the work that goes into preparing food and cooking, which might include um, collecting water, uh, preparing food, shopping, all those sorts of things. Looking after children or people or sick people, all of this is unpaid, and that all together is what we mean by unpaid care work. Um, I put in there a quote from Debbie Butler as well. Um, it is work, a lot of the time when, you, when, when surveys are done and collect this kind of data, it's very clear that this kind of work occupies a very large quantity of most women's time in developing countries. And in fact, uh, Smerica started to analyze some of the national data for Indonesia, and it shows that quite a significant proportion of time, particularly for young, for young women, um, is spent on these sorts of activities. It's interesting that this is not measured, generally speaking. It's not, it's not seen as work, but it's mainly not seen as work because nobody is paid for it. It's women do it for love of the family, love of their children, love of their in-laws, whatever it is. Um, that it's not, it's not considered to be economic. However, if children are not brought up properly, if people are not fed, if houses are not kept clean, people cannot work. So we think of this as, as producing the workers, or producing the, the labor, if you like, um, this is the work of care. Um, I couldn't find a really good number for you, um, and then I found this to give you a sense of how important care could be. Um, in Tanzania, um, if they improved water supplies, they estimate that it would release enough time for women to, for another million full-time jobs for women, 
and increase income by 6% of cash earnings. I mean, this is, these are estimates, but they're, they're, quite, they're quite seriously thought through, quite well, well designed models they come up with these numbers. So these are the kinds of things, that's just water as well, that doesn't say anything about childcare or healthcare or any other sorts of things. So you can see the cost of, of care to women's time and to the economy. And then crisis, what do we mean by crisis? Well, we mean lots of different things, and I'm no longer sure that we should talk about crisis because this is every day now. I've put some pictures there for you to see. There's Greece at the top. Uh, at the bottom you have your own fuel riots from, when was it? March, April? When were the fuel riots here? That's, I think that's uh, Jakarta down there, isn't it? Yeah. Um, I think all of these these events are related to the crisis, the food price rises, the fuel price rises, um, the situation now with Greece and other southern European countries um, is likely to lead to a return of the global financial crisis globally. Uh, already in Europe they have what they call the double dip, so they've had one recession, they're having another, um, and in between they were briefly out of recession. Um, I think what is really important about this, and this is my own um, assessment of the situation, is that in 2008-2009, when the first round of the crisis hit, a lot of countries were sitting on quite healthy fiscal balances, including Indonesia, and a lot of the other countries we work in as well, and they had the money to spend to start a new program, to do a fiscal stimulus of several million dollars if they needed to. Uh, if the global financial crisis hits again, which looks increasingly likely, uh, most of those countries don't have that money anymore because they've spent it. And not only have they spent it, fuel prices have been shooting up. And a lot of countries like Indonesia spend a lot of money on fuel subsidies. So it gets more and more difficult to find the money to spend on social protection schemes and fiscal stimulus in that situation. Now, having said that we're living in a a, a, a phase of constant crisis. There's also something, another very interesting thing that's going on, which is that earlier this year the World Bank released new global poverty numbers. And these new global poverty numbers seem to say, what crisis? Poverty worldwide is reducing. Not only is it reducing, it's reducing fast. Everyone's doing very well. So what can we, how do we make sense of this? Well, yeah, you're shaking your head. I completely agree. I, if you talk to any actual people living in on low incomes anywhere in the world, it doesn't feel like everyone's doing very well. Uh, there are a number of explanations. Uh, when, when we launched the book, the Living Through Crisis book in the World Bank um, last month, I think it was, um, we did have these discussions. How can you reconcile your findings about people struggling to cope with crisis with these global poverty figures? And one of the things we have to say is, well, there are a lot of people who are clustering around the poverty line, just below the poverty line, or just above the poverty line, who are very vulnerable. When food prices go up, these are the ones who, come, who fall below the poverty line. So it's just not, it's the moderate form about whom we need to really worry, I think, in this time. So that's crisis. I want to talk to you now a bit about the impacts of these triple F crises on, on what we're calling care, on unpaid care work. Um, using our own data. I'll show you a couple of these. Now I have to do my Indonesian island thing. Okay, you have to show you things. First of all, the, the, this is working, you can hear me, right? Um, first of all, the, the key thing is that when you get a, a food price shock like you had in 2000, 2009, or people lose their jobs, which was also the case, you have fewer resources, you have less money to spend, food costs more, you have you have less coming in, so you have to you have to really work harder to keep the household going, to keep the kids in their school uniforms, to buy books, and in particular to spend on food. Most poor households, most low income households, spend most of their money on food, and I think that's true here as well as some of the other countries we worked on. This was this was one of the original activities we did in 2008, 2000, and 2009, and this shows you what happened in Zambia. In 2009, food prices went up so much after 2000, uh, 2008, they went up so much. By 2009, this is what people were buying with 5,000 bacha. Whereas the year before, they were buying this. 
And some of the things you can't see here is that you can see the quantities are obviously different. But what you can't see here is here they're getting some kind of small fish. Here there's no fish. There's no protein. So it's not only about quantity, it's also about quality. They don't have oil here. There are lots of things they don't have here. Here again, this is in this is exam here. This one is in, in Bangladesh, in Kappa. Uh, here you see this was at the height of the food price spike last year, when in particular the price of rice, but other things as well were really high. This is not we always talk about rice and meat and these and, and maize, but it's not just those things. It's also meat and oil and fish and anything, anything high quality, any of the, the side dishes that we have here um, that, that, uh, that people can't afford. So what you see here is this, this woman, Mrs. Barno, she, she couldn't buy lentils. She bought a not so nice tasty fish, it was small fish, not a nice one. But this basket here cost her more, cost her uh, 185, 1.56 US dollars. And if she bought that a year before, it would have cost her one dollar thirteen cents. But she had to buy less, and she's still spending more. Also, a year ago she's buying two kinds of soap. This year, no soap. So you can see all of the impact this is likely to have on your on your unpaid care work, keeping clean, keeping the children healthy, and so on. But the other thing that we found a lot of was that people were women in particular were moving into the informal economy, moving into all kinds of jobs. You know, hairdressers and a little bit of petty trading or uh, doing some laundry, doing all of these extra things, very low pay, very low skilled work, just because the cost of living had increased, maybe that husband had lost his job and his business wasn't doing well. So people, women were also moving into that, which meant they had less time to do childcare, to do other things. So that these were other impacts that we had. And in general, we saw, you can see down there, um, women buying, that's a side of the by, yeah, this is red, in Banda. Um, women were, were buying in smaller quantities. In a lot of countries, you would find that they would go shopping, so you would have to go shopping more frequently. And you buy smaller quantities, which is always more expensive to buy in smaller quantities than in bigger quantities. Uh, but often you find women were going, walking further to find better bargains, to buy cheaper food. Or they were buying less good quality food, which meant trying to, trying to work harder to make the food tasty. A lot of the, the, the other the household members who complain the food is disgusting. Why why are we eating that horrible food? Bad food, the rice smells, whatever. So a lot of, a lot more effort was going into it, a lot more time. We we spoke to women in Kenya who were working for 18 hours a day. And uh, it's it's a it's a long it's a long day just to just to keep the basic, you know, stuff on the table, water and so on. Um, I also want to show you this is a, I'm to talk to you about the, the protein quality. This I wanted to show you in 2011, we saw in, in 2008, we saw people eating fish in Zambia. By 2011, they're eating caterpillars. It's a caterpillar. I don't know, people say caterpillars are very tasty, but it wasn't the preferred food by any means. They would prefer to eat fish and fish food. So that was caterpillars there. Um, and all of this causes stress, a lot of stress. <laughs> this is something the surveys never pick up. We found a lot of very stressed people had a lot of very strained marital relationships. Not everywhere. In some places, people felt that the crisis made them come together, made them look after each other better, made them value each other more. But on the whole, having less money, having not enough money to eat the kind of food that you want to eat, and we're not talking about champagne and five-star restaurants here, we're talking about really quite basic foods, nutritious foods, fruit and vegetables, even in England, in fact, we saw, you know, one of the richest countries in the world, people were complaining they can't give their children fruit. Uh, but this causes a lot of strain on relationships uh, in the family, but also in the community more widely. Um, you want to... I put this, these quotes up because one of the things I was so struck by was um, when, when we read all these, um, these, these interview and focus group notes, in all of the countries you would hear, some woman would say somewhere, the hardest thing is getting the children to go to school in the morning. And anyone here who has children will know, sometimes it's very hard to get the children to go to school in the morning, even when they've got a nice breakfast. But when they don't have any breakfast, it's extremely hard. And this was a real source of stress, um, caused a lot of problems, but it was, it was a really common theme everywhere. The, the, the thing that they said in, in, in Vegasi was not that they couldn't feed the children, but the children were reluctant to go to school because they didn't have enough money for snacks, and they felt embarrassed. 
they wanted to have good, kind of good snacks and they didn't have it. So at least, you know, it wasn't a matter of not eating here, but it was nevertheless. But these, these quotations really did, uh, they really brought it home for me the strain of, of the food price rises um, and, and how hard that was for children and therefore how hard it was for parents. Um, I think when you think about the development impacts of all of this, I think there are a number of quite clear links between, um, between the crisis, unpaid care work, and MDG outcomes if you're thinking about health, if you're thinking about maternal mortality, if you're thinking about early childhood development, women's empowerment, any of these if you care to look at, the link with crisis and therefore the link with unpaid okay, care work is quite, is quite direct. I think what's going to happen in the next year or so, and as we move down towards 2015 and thinking about what happens to the next round of MDGs, um, I think we have to look out really for the fiscal crisis. Now, I, I've spent some time looking for numbers on this, but nobody has so far brought together a good analysis of how social spending has been affected uh, by these crises. It's, it varies in different countries, it's certainly true. In a lot of countries, there's been a lot more spending on social protection schemes. These tend to be quite targeted, narrowly targeted to often the extreme poor, which means that you have a lot of, in general, a lot of other people who are moderately poor or are vulnerable to poverty who are not protected. I think this is an important aspect of this. But we're also seeing, of course, that governments are trying everywhere to cut subsidies, for example, the fuel subsidy. And that is causing people to be unhappy. Whether it's making them a lot worse off, I don't know. Um, but on the whole, people do feel that these things will make them worse off. These are things to watch out for. Um, I think also that, as I said earlier, if, if, the, if there is a second round of the global financial crisis and it affects developing countries, they won't have, many countries will not have the money in the budget to spend like they did in 2008-2009. So I would be concerned that then social spending would, would tend to get squeezed. And that is what happened in 2009. No, I think I'm still not going on that. Unmeasured impacts. The, the other thing to look out for, the reason, the reason I think this is, the impacts of crisis on care is so important has largely to do with the fact that care work is not measured in national statistics. It's, not, it's rarely given any attention by policymakers. Policymakers, on the whole, just assume it's free. They talk about women's empowerment, women should go out and work, and so on and so forth, without taking into account that somebody also has to look after the babies and look after the older people and cook the food. And when, when you have fewer resources and less time, that becomes harder. That becomes harder to do. And the person who is usually doing that kind of work is usually, not always, usually the women in the household. So these things tend to be unmeasured. But I think that these unmeasured impacts have direct consequences for women's empowerment. If you are running around trying to make a decent meal out of very expensive, not very tasty food, you will have less time to be building your business or going to college or any of the things that might contribute to women's empowerment, getting involved in politics or something. Less time for that, less energy for that. These, these are not things that anyone's measuring. The other thing, of course, an obvious one, and this is very important for Indonesia, is, is internal mortality, internal health. The impacts of not being able to afford a good doctor, not being able to afford good food, stress and strain, all of these things will have definitely impacts on internal mortality. It will be slow, but I think these effects will eventually be, will eventually be felt. They may offset other policy advances that are being made in this area. Clearly, early childhood development is a, is a real issue here. Uh, as we all know, the first two years of, of an infant's life are the critical times for cognitive development, for physical development. If you are malnutrition in those first two years, that's a permanent, that's a permanent damage done the, right there. Uh, nutrition in general, I think what we're going to see is not that people aren't having enough to eat, but the quality of what they're eating is definitely declining. We see this everywhere. There's less protein. Or, or the diversity, I should say, fewer vegetables and so on and so forth. Health and well-being, particularly in relation to stress, and family and social relations are also, I think, likely to be affected. Not permanently in all cases, but in some cases, certainly. 
uh, in countries like Kenya, where the food prices are particularly severe, you see uh, families breaking down uh, in other places as well. This is also true, but we saw this primarily in Kenya. So we are now, this is my final slide, I just wanted to tell you a little bit about where we're going next with this kind of work and this kind of thinking. We, we didn't, when we started this work, we hadn't expected to find the impacts on care to be so significant and so important. And as we have done this work year on year, it has become clearer and clearer that this is an area that needs to be focused on more closely. In the last year or so, um, several other projects have been de that being developed on the back of this. One is, or two in fact, um, projects funded by DFID and Swedish CEDA have to do with the political economy of care. Why, why is it that unpaid care work is so invisible to policymakers? What can be done about this? And this is work that is going on in, actually it's going on in Africa as well, but we're doing some work in Bangladesh and Indonesia, Smeru is working with us on this, and we're also going to be working at the global level to see how can we get these things more visible, how can we start measuring them more effectively so that we can monitor and track these impacts on, on unpaid care. Uh, the other project that we're doing is another very large project. It's a 10 country study, again, fair and involved from the Indonesia side, looking at what we're calling, we're calling it life in a time of food price volatility. And we're going to continue our qualitative tracking work um, to look at, among other things, how food price changes are affecting unpaid care and also how they're affecting what we're calling informal social protection, or the, the, the sort of customary sources of assistance and also how those are related to government social, social protection schemes and so on. I think I'm going to leave it there. Okay, now me, it's like you talk about 25 minutes. So now it's time for discussions, questions, comments, and anything, ideas, sharing, experience from the floor. Yeah, we have Mamiya here. Yeah, let's go back to your slide uh, context. Mm -hmm. Okay. This one? Yeah. So if we have to pay for the camera, how much is it pay? Okay. So I need to wait for another. Any other questions or else you can just call the answer? Not with that one, it's a good question. Very good question. Um, you can quantify these to some extent because in some places we don't do our own childcare. We, we send out old people to an old person's home, and you can you can uh, you can monetize that. You know how much it costs to get a maid. You know how much it costs to send your child to boarding school or whatever. Um, but that's never a perfect substitute for the care in the home, partly because because of affection, because of love, because of all the things that go with it. So you can never perfectly substitute unpaid care for paid care, I think that's important. Um, however, estimates have been made of the, of the um, contribution of unpaid care work to national economies, and it's quite significant, ranging in the you know, 15 to 20% uh, contribution to, to GDP, and more in some cases. So it is, it is very significant. If you had to pay every woman to, you know, clean the baby's bottom and make the dinner and so on and so forth. You'd be spending a lot more money than you're spending currently. And so we could also uh, take into account the uh, educational background of the woman doing the care work? I think that's, that's important. I mean, I think one of the things that the this is one of the reasons why women's education is so significant for social development and human, human capital development generally, I think, is that more educated women are better carers in the sense of better at providing good quality nutrition, better at providing health care, better at uh, child care, early child care and, and those sorts of things. So that does, all of that does matter, yes. Um, I don't know if that answers your question though. Okay. Thank you very much for your presentation. Well, as you probably know, there's been a lot of work done in Indonesia, and I'm sure you're using that in your research. It's used as an example of how to cope with uh, the financial crisis. UNICEF organized a very high-level meeting a couple of years ago. We 
Bus Sri Mulyani, at that time Minister of Finance in Indonesia, attended as keynote speaker, and it was brought as a good practice in terms of the unconditional cash transfer, the conditional cash transfers, the scholarships for the poor, etc., etc. And um, so I think there is a wealth of experience and information in Indonesia that can really a lot of added value, I feel, to what you are presenting in the work you have planned, as well as around the world, specifically, for example, on impact on child care, impact on education, impact on health. There's really so much work done on the impact of the economic crisis in social development, which I'm sure you are aware of. One of the specific questions I asked, I wanted to ask is, I think some of the issues you mentioned have many different aspects to it, and it is very difficult to draw a straight line of attribution. For example, the issue of breaking down marriages, in passing you refer to, let's say, a comparison between Kenya and other countries. I think one has to take into consider very many sociological and other factors because that might not be only linked to economic crisis. The difference might be some of the value differences between countries, the already existing trends and statistics, what does it show about divorces in that country, how is it among different ethnic groups, different quintiles, different levels of education, etc. So I think some of the comments, I know there is a time issue involved uh, where if I can say a bit general and homogenizing, whereas there are a lot of uh, more subtle and sometimes not so subtle factors that determine what direction and what trend and pattern and what impact all of this has, considering also many other variables. That's a bit what I wanted to offer. Thank you. Questions? Comments?
one of the things that we're trying to draw out of this research, which, um, which other work, more sectorally focused work, has not really uh, done. Uh, and absolutely, you're completely right about this problem of attribution. Uh, I think this is why we have never really made a strong case of saying, we know that this caused that. Um, anyone who thinks that they can say that in a time of such great complexity, when there's so many different vectors and so many different factors and transmission channels, nobody can really say they know for sure what causes what. We've always been much more modest in what we've said, which is we're saying that at these times of crises, the impacts that people report, and that people say they're feeling, are these and the others. Uh, it might be, as you say, that the reasons people break up, marriages break up in Kenya, have to do with culture and all sorts of things. I think they have a lot to do, however, with an ongoing food crisis and a drought of eight years, and a government that has been very slow to respond. Um, and people say, people say that this is the, the, the triggers are things like, you know, inability to get food, the need to migrate far away, and never coming back, and so on and so forth. So I completely agree about the many sociological factors and the subtle and not so subtle dimensions of this. I think we, we, we report it in a much more modest way, a much more this is what people say um, sort of sense. Um, I think I didn't give a very good account of the objectives from the research, so I should do so now. Um, initially, I think really we went out because we just needed to have to get a sense of what is going on actually on the ground. In 2009, when we first went, there were no nobody knew. There was a bit of some journalists had been out, some media work was there, but really nobody had gone and really spoken to people that actually how are you being impacted. So it was really just to, you know. It's all fun. Not for fun. It wasn't. It wasn't much fun. <laughs> it was very hard work, and I put the pressure on these guys really heavily. But it was. It was no. It was just to have a listen to see what actually. What are people saying about what's going on on the ground? To really touch base with reality, because there's all these estimates. There was at the time when many of my colleagues were being uh, 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 commissioned by the World Bank, UNICEF, DFID, all of these organisations to do simulations. There are loads of econometric models, simulation exercises, blah, blah, all of this fancy data stuff, but nobody was going to talk to actual humans who were being affected, so we went and did that, and this was, this was, a, this was a, you know, the first time I think anyone had really done that at that point. Now, now there's plenty of, you know, much better, you know, stronger, larger sample sets or whatever um, going on. Uh, still now the data is a bit limited, I think, but our objectives were partly that. But as we... When we got there, the first thing that we saw was, although everyone in the West in particular was talking about a financial crisis, what people were talking about, what poor people were talking about, was food crisis. So this was, this was at this time when everyone was worried about finance, and people were saying, actually, what well, financial crisis, you know, actually the critical issue here is the price of life. So this was a real reality check. Then later, when we went back again, we wanted to look at these social effects. How are these communities you know, community relations, social cohesion, gender relations, um, and these, these other social impacts were being affected because people weren't looking at that. Does that answer? Okay, for the next round, any questions? You want to see Thank you. Uh, if we make a comparison, comparison among uh, five countries in this study, uh, which country had the most affected by the crisis and why? And which country had the shortest uh, period, uh, recovery period from crisis and can you explain uh, and why? Uh, the second? Third. I'm really interested in your uh, last page. Uh,
I read uh, Jakarta Post article yesterday. Uh, uh, I want to know about what do you think on the phenomenon uh, at the America uh, in the last 10 years that there is an increase of men who work in a pink color world. Uh, the pink color world is 90% uh, of women work in this area, like uh, data systems and Service sector. Service sector. In the article, they said that uh, in the time of the crisis, uh, many of men uh, come to the pink color work and they have a plenty of time to uh, give uh, the care work for the children uh, to uh, domestic workers and something like that. So, um, is it, is it a good? If we want to measure about the family and the social relations, uh, what do you suggest? Uh, this area, uh, uh, as far as I know, uh, uh, is very common for the anthropology method. Uh, how, uh, how about your suggestion on the how to measure the family and social relations? Because uh, if we want to implement a parent family uh, in Indonesia, uh, is it a measure? Uh, one of the indicator of the measurements of from your uh, term on this or not?
sector workers are migrants and they live in dormitories and they don't get included in the surveys. So these are some of the interesting things that we find when you look, if you look at qualitative and quantitative, these are the kinds of insights that you get. It's hard to see how they were affected. Uh, the shortest recovery period, similarly, I think it's, it's, it's very difficult to say. I think it also depends very much on which community you're looking at. Uh, so, for example, in, in London, in London the, the rubber prices recovered very quickly because of the financial crisis. Oh, no, after, yes, because of the financial crisis, rubber prices recovered. And so, because of the recovery. So, people were doing very well there immediately after the crisis. I don't, I don't know how you, can, how you can judge that. Country recovery time is, I think, a different matter. But they have, all of these things have lasting effects on the institutions of the world. This, yeah, please. No, no, no. Yeah. But um, once we recover, for example, in Baja and Bikasi, but another threat is coming, like in Bikasi, uh, the potential of labor market flexibility that threatens the times of, of, of working for the for very low end workers. And in Baja, there is a problem with context to other local factors like roads and uh, mining, uh, illegal mining, things like that. So, you recover from the global financial crisis, but then you have a local crisis happening. Yeah. On, this, on this point about the pink collar workers, I mean, this is the pink collar, as you call it, the service sector. It is very interesting. It's one of the things that we, we hope will be included in our, in our study that we are working on now, more an action research project on that. Um, it is really interesting to see how rapidly it's changed in Indonesia and in other Asian countries as well. Uh, you know, the entry into the formal labor force, or sometimes it's formal, informal, somewhere in between that, but into the paid labor force, is having a huge impact on women's capacities to, uh, to provide unpaid care work. Um, in terms of an indicator on family and social relations, we'll have to talk, I think probably here is not the, the place to, to discuss it, but there are, certain, there are certain indicators that you can use, I think, that are as common as some countries around the world, they have developed these things to look at uh, family and social relations, how they're affected. Definitely, without a doubt, if women are working eight to ten hour days, including um, uh, commuting to work, um, this, this will have an impact on the quality of care. I think it's, it's quite evident that that will be the case. <laughs> I just, want, I just like to share our similar research I'm from Spain. We did a similar research two years ago on gender and food security or insecurity. As you know, food security, uh, food insecurity can be caused by economic or natural crisis. So, there are two surprisingly uh, findings from our study. First, we look at uh, who fetch the water during the normal time and the crisis time. And we found out that uh, during the normal time, women in the household or children fetch the water. But facing the different crisis, like in the, in the dry season, uh, men in the family uh, fetch the water. The reason is because during the dry season, um, uh, the source of water is uh, further, and they have to go there during the night because um, they have to be on, on the line, uh, long line to to, to wait for the water. So they say that it's not safe for women to fetch the water. So men take the responsibility to take the water. So there is an in the household sick in the crisis. So I was uh, a woman in the family uh, suffer more during the crisis. And the second surprisingly finding uh, was that you, uh, your picture saw that during the crisis, household uh, has less food, right? And then we asked, who uh, um, ate less food when they facing with less food? And surprisingly, also men, adult men in the household ate less. The reason is because uh, adult men in the household, they went to the field, they went to the forest uh, to do the farming. And in the field they eat, uh, they found something, I mean, raw roots or anything they can eat, they eat that, and then when they home, they eat uh, food. While other family members, they have to eat what they have in the house. So this kind of surprising findings is 
it's also useful to see how the, the, the Idra households relate to the city in prices.
tear. This is this is not something that we know the answer to. There is there is a very and, and, and Kiki and I have had these discussions here as well. It is actually quite tricky politically and in policy terms to raise the issue of care, the invisibility of care, um, the policy problem of care, without without pandering to a very regressive. Uh, far right agenda, in some cases, or a very pro religious agenda, which may not be supportive of women's empowerment, women's rights, uh, and or turning it into a, you know, a, commod a commodity, saying, well, we can pay people to do it, so it's whatever, which it can't be. Uh, we've, we've been working on all sorts of other things. There are a number of uh, new papers that have come out recently I can share with you. Um, some new thinking is emerging about how to reconceptualize economies so that they, they are more respectful and more inclusive of, of unpaid work. Um, my colleagues Marcia Fontana and Rosalind Aikman are very involved with all of this, so I can share some materials with you that are trying to deal with this. But as I say, I find it quite tricky. I, I'm, I'm, you know, as a feminist myself, I find it very difficult to introduce these issues without trying to say on the one hand, and as you were suggesting, maybe women in the increasing numbers in the service sector is not such a great thing. Well, it might not be without the support that you need to be able to also look after your children and household, or the need for men to do more of their share of the housework, which from the work that Swera were doing, looking at the, 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 the Susanas data, Susanas data is enough, it looks like a lot of the care work increasingly in Indonesia is being done by young girls. Um, men are not taking on more of their share just because their wives are working. These are some of the issues, I think. Anyway, I will share those things with you afterwards. Thank you. Um, I think the critical juncture of the so-called strained relationship uh, happening as an impact of the crisis uh, trying to accommodate all the discussion that we have uh, discussed uh, today, also the subtlety and complexity of the issue felt is the violence against women. Probably it, it worth uh, think about or uh, look for the data from the National Commission of uh, Elimination of Violence Against Women in Indonesia that increasingly more and more divorce cases in the court, recording divorce cases in the court uh, on the basis of uh, domestic violence are economic violence or economic negligence of the partners. So I think um, the, the critical juncture is not a straight relationship, but the likelihood of women being or wives being neglected by their husbands because of the cause of the economic crisis. Although I understand that in order to, to be strongly explain the causality of, of this uh, two phenomena could not be easily uh, generated due to the nature of the uh, qualitative study, but I think it's worth looking at it. That's an excellent suggestion for our work that we're doing now on care, so we can, we can certainly follow that up. I think that's a great idea. Thank you for that. Uh, thank you for a very interesting presentation. Uh, I myself from Sumeru. I think uh, economists like myself should put more attention into this uh, unpaid care role. I think. You have shown the importance of uh, this issue. Uh, I have three comments, if I may. Yeah. Uh, the first one, I think uh, one uh, low hanging fruit recommendation that you can make is to suggest uh, statistical agency to start collecting uh, time spent on this uh, unpaid care work. And that should not be too difficult to accommodate because they already collecting unpaid work for economic activities. Like if women and children working in family businesses, they already collect the time spent on these businesses, although they don't get paid from them. But maybe you will have to uh, tell them how to uh, 
measure the time span of error accurately because I think it will not be straightforward. For example, if a mother takes care of a baby while watching telenovelas for three hours, uh, how many hours is for taking a baby? How many hours for watching telenovelas? Not this <laughs> uh, My second comment is on the contribution of Carol to the economy, to the GDP. He said it's 15 to 20 percent. I'm still not sure if that 15 to 20 percent is already uh, part of the GDP or is it on top that should be added to current GDP. Because, take for example, uh, the farming family, the husband, wife, and children, the wife was, uh, taking care of the children, not working in the, in the farm. Say the husband produced an output of 1 million rupiah in a year. Uh, if the wife suddenly died, then the husband has to take care of the children. Uh, the output for next year probably will fall to half the 50%. So in that case, I would think that the care work is already included in the GDP. Because without, without the care work, the, the, the farmer cannot produce as much as before. So I think we have to decide whether uh, the output of care work is it an intermediate product or is it a final product. That is a very big uh, question. My last comment, uh, I was very interested by your story uh, on reconciling the global uh, declining in poverty with the crisis story. Because that also what happens here in Indonesia. If you, like, if you look at the trend of poverty in this country, it's continuous uh, going down. Yeah. But if we read a newspaper every day, uh, it's all negative. People say that we are now getting miserable uh, every day. It's very difficult to reconcile between the two. And I think your explanations about many people living around the poverty line cannot really explain that because when the poverty trend is going down like that, it means that the distribution is shifting to the right. Although the people around the poverty line is still a lot, but they are different people. The people who are already in the southern of the poverty line will be far away, and the people who are from below now become near the poverty line. I think the, the reconciliation maybe has to do with the increasing expectations. Because as the economy is uh, improving, property decline, and the people who uh, poor become a helpless friends with similar situation. So therefore they now become, become even poorer relatively because other people are becoming better off. Uh, but this is just a hypothesis that you need to Thank you. Um, are you sure you're an economist? <laughs> That's meant as a compliment. No. Very interesting. I think that the idea of your low-hanging fruit recommendation is definitely one we're going to try to adopt um, with our, with our follow-on projects in, in care, because we think there's a lot of scope there. I think uh, you know, in, in a country where maternal mortality is a major concern, um, I think there will be an interest in trying to figure out any ways possible, really, of, of taking action on that. And I think certainly measuring the amount of time people put into care, and care work, will, will be a good start there. So I think that would be possible to do as well. There are many different ways of measuring time use, of ti collecting time use data. Lots of countries have experimented with lots of different approaches. I'm sure there are many examples from Indonesia as well. Um, and it's, it's a lot of effort, but you can do it quite well now. So that's definitely one we're trying to do. On whether, um, I mean, I think, I think this question of the contribution to GDP is one of those tricky issues where we, we get close to this issue of commodifying something which is quite difficult to monetize. It, it, it is difficult to, and it's probably not entirely desirable to monetize um, a kind of work which often involves affection and love, and those things you can't, at least I, I don't think you can, monetize. Um, 
but I think the way it's usually done is um, it, as, as an intermediate. Um, you, know, you, can, you, can, you can calculate it in all sorts of ways. You can make estimates of the contribution of care in all sorts of different ways. But I think on the whole, it is, if you like, inbuilt into the quality of your workers, inbuilt into you know, how healthy they are, how good they are, how skilled they are, and all the rest of it. It's the quality of their, of their, of their care. Um, I think you can because here you also do research in love. <laughs> do you? Is that right? <laughs> you need some work on research. So I'm not good. I'll talk to you about that. So I, think it's, I think it's very under researched. <laughs> <Yes. laughs> um, on reconciling global poverty, the global poverty numbers with, with our story, I think it's very tricky. I, mean, I, 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 I did have this discussion with, with people in the World Bank, uh, as I said last month. That, and uh, there are people who are, who are, like us, monitoring the food crisis and thinking, wow, this is a really serious situation. And then, you know, down the corridor in, you know, in DC, there's some people saying, global poverty is doing so well, we're, you know, solving world poverty, everyone's very happy. And they're finding it very difficult, they don't know what to do about it. And the thing that Marsh Rebellion said, and I have to say, with all due respect, to the World Bank, they were very cautious when they brought out those numbers. And I think at the national level as well, it would be worthwhile to look at them with a bit more caution. But at the global level, they were very cautious. And they said, what's happening with world poverty figures is the extreme poor, bottom 10, 20%, have declined in number dramatically over the last five years, mostly because of China and India. But it's the moderate poor and the people clustering around the poverty line who have increased in number. So you have a clustering, a lot of people, a bulge. So it's not that the distribution has just shifted down, there's been a, a, a bulge in the middle. And it's those people who don't typically get much in the way of support from the state. So when, when you have a food crisis, if you like, they're the ones who are left on their own, you deal with it. You're not the poorest, you don't need help. And I think that's something we did see quite a lot of, is people who aren't really that poor, but when, when prices shoot up, they really do need help, they need protection. And they expect protection as well. And your point about reading the paper and every day it's misery, when in fact you look at the numbers and incomes are rising, this is really interesting because I think the, the standard poverty measures don't measure misery. They measure cash incomes and food overlay. They don't measure the fact that, as we saw, many people are eating. They're eating okay, but it's not nice food. They don't like what they're eating. They hate it. They eat stuff that tastes bad. They eat stuff that their great-grandparents ate. They eat stuff, in some cases, that they feed the animals. So they're not happy. They're not happy with what they're eating. It might be calorifically fine. It might be nutritionally fine. They don't like it. It makes them unhappy. So this misery point is interesting. I think also your point about increasing expectations is very, very key. It's not only that the people are seeing there are fewer people like me, but also wages are going up. Cash wages are going up by a lot. You know, if you look at the cash incomes, the nominal incomes that people are making, they're going up. But nobody's getting better off. Imagine how it feels if your salary doubles tomorrow, but actually the cost of living increases by the same. How could you, you must feel this is terrible. I'm getting more money, it means nothing. I think this is the, the key thing for me is, is expectations. People's expectations are not being met. They're earning so much money, but actually the quality of life is poor. That's my point. Can I say something on that? Because maybe time has run out. I would say, Paul said, thank you. Besides expectation, it means, I think it also shows that even though uh, poverty is being reduced, those who are still poor, in, in addition to maybe expectations, they are very cognizant of the fact that the gap between rich and poor, however, has increased and has not been reduced. And the Gini coefficient for Indonesia, as I have read and learned from Paaset and his colleagues, actually is on the increase, right, Paaset? Yes. So I think, you know, you can, um, poor people are very aware and intelligent and very conscious of the fact that, yes, maybe relatively few of us are living under line of poverty, but meanwhile, also the gap between rich and poor in my country is increasing. So I think that is a big contribution to dissatisfaction. And it's not so much or all or as much the issue of raising expectations. Thank you. So, um, more question. Uh, uh, thank you very much for your uh, explanations about the impact of 
uh, crisis on the uh, care world. And uh, yeah, I have know much about uh, what is lived by a woman. Uh, but uh, I still uh, have a question for you. It is actually a basic question. What should be done uh, related to the impact of crisis on the uh, woman who who do the care work? Uh, what should be done with them? What should be done with these conditions? Uh, what is your recommendations due to your findings uh, in the countries that you you are uh, studying? Uh, because uh, uh, looking at the, your presentations, I still confused. Uh, show what things that we can do for future, which can make us be better when we pass. The I'm Lydia from University of Indonesia. Uh, I'm interested in hearing this term commodifying. Uh, does, does that mean bringing the activity into market or rather just evaluation? Of uh, the monetary value of the activity itself. If the later, I think uh, I think it's important to do, uh, especially in the context of policy, because policy makers uh, will need to have some kind of data and uh, to make their uh, decisions. And if you have uh, values of these activities. It can uh, act as an as a indicator of trade-offs, trade-off between uh, working, for example, and trade-off uh, between spending on a certain social uh, support program or others. Uh, I'm not at all familiar with this, with this issue, but I would like to uh, make a comparison with what uh, is going on in the environmental um, uh, sector, which is valuation economic valuation of environmental services, meaning the services that the, the environment provides that is not being traded in the market, um, is very important to show that, for example, a forest is not the value of its trees as logs, but also the value that it gives as uh, a contributes to a uh, hydrological cycle and biodiversity, etc. Uh, recommendations essentially from this work. I think I think they probably these recommendations would be at, at several different levels. Um, the first is uh, we need to be much better at monitoring these impacts and tracking them and measuring them. So that would be quite an early, that would be quite a high order um, policy recommendation is definitely gear your statistical systems, your monitoring activities uh, more clearly towards these these usually invisible kinds of work um, to make sure that you're capturing this. Um, a second would be that your crisis response mechanisms, whether they're social protection or whatever they are, need to be much more responsive to, need to be much more sensitive to and responsive to, to, to the needs of women as well as the needs of men. As, as they currently stand, fiscal stimulus packages, some people have done some analysis of this, and fiscal stimulus packages on the whole benefited big companies and medium-sized firms and mostly directly men, uh, whereas austerity measures mostly hit women. Uh, cuts in social spending, pensions or child benefit allowances, any of these sorts of social programs mostly hit women. So on the whole, there's been a lack of awareness of how uh, attempts to cope with the crisis have affected men and women differently in different countries. The third thing, of course, is what you can directly do. And there are a lot of very, very good, well-known well examples of how you can develop a, a gender-sensitive food security program or a gender-sensitive social protection system. In many countries, conditional cash transfers have been very successful in not only supporting uh, unpaid care work by you know, 
paying women essentially to take their children to the doctor or the, to keep them in school. But also because of the, the, the relationship it sets up between governments and women, it's also quite empowering in some cases, not all cases, but in most cases. So conditional cash transfers are a classic way of supporting this. As are um, uh, schemes that encourage and enable families to keep children in school. On the whole, this is what people want to do. Uh, if you have feeding programs or scholarship programs and the rest of it, these tend to be very supportive. And they do help uh, with the unpaid care work. Um, I think those are some of the things yeah. that would be recommendations. On this issue of the commodification, I mean, I think that's a discussion to have with the colleagues from UNICEF and UN Women behind you as well. I think it's a really interesting debate, and I, I, I feel that commodification is is it, it is risky. On the other hand, I see exactly what you're saying. If you need to convince policymakers, do they understand anything that doesn't have a dollar sign in front of it? Well, I don't know. And maybe the point is partly to expand their thinking, to make them think about economies in a broader and more inclusive way, as not just about dollars. I think the thing we've really learned about the world, the way the world's economy is run in the last four or five years is exactly that. If you're only ever looking at profits, you're really not, that, that is not good economic governance. There are other externalities that must be taken into account, um, and, and certainly care work. You gave the example of the environment; is I mean, it's, it's a classic example. Um, it's a very similar example to care, in fact. Um, and I think I think that would that would be what I would say. I mean, I, I appreciate the, the idea. You do have to convince policymakers, but I think partly we have to encourage policymakers to be more open-minded about what is what is valued economically and otherwise in society. But we can have more of a debate about that. I'd be quite happy to. <laughs> Uh, I think you cannot really use the 
care was provided by the state uh, to value the care work at home because there are two different things. The, the one from the state uh, will continue no matter what quality is uh, provided by them because they have no market value. So in order to get the value of the home uh, care, you should put it in the market, in the real market, which is uh, criteria that you love the, the elderly, you take care of somebody, and somebody will bid for you. So you get the highest bid, then that's the, the value of your uh, home. Now the problem is, it is because if the state provided, then it is not comparable to the actual. It doesn't have to be in the market. We have a classic principal agent problem. Though. Who's going to make sure that that who's going to make sure that that, that provider does love the patient, does love the elderly person? You can't you can't monitor that. This is why this is why it is ultimately a different thing. I don't I don't think you can put money on money value on that. It could be wrong, but I don't think you can. There's a person at the back there who has an idea about this. You can it quickly. Quickly. I love these ideal worlds that you can live in. research recently uh, about the care economy in the market and it's sort of showing that the prices that we're paying for the women that care for our children and care for our grandparents, they're being poorly paid and part of that is because we expect them to love the people that they care for. So it is part of their job somehow to be more caring than it would be for a manager of a big company. And they get less paid because of that. So it's kind of interesting, and well, there's some research that is emerging uh, telling this story. So that's one point. Another point is uh, a story that just came out of Australia of an action that was taken by women in the care economy uh, to um, basically demand increase of salary uh, by arguing that the skills that they were using uh, were wrongly being compared or sort of sort of naturally being assumed to be feminine and they were pay, being paid less than men or sectors that have a more equal um, gender um, balance uh, that use a similar set of skills. And I, I sort of don't know the details of this case, but it was actually, they won a case in Australia and their, um, the government has had to action uh, to get an increase in their salaries across the board. So there's been some movements, basically sort of, I suppose, opening this box that um, the market just naturally will be able to put a good price. Mm -hmm. And instead of saying that it isn't paying you uh, giving a good price, just because most of these uh, sectors are just very, very feminine. And there are naturally, we assume that love doesn't have any cost. <laughs> okay. Well, actually, you see how interesting your presentation has been, Naomi? <laughs> so much discussion. Actually, something in line with this that I have learned from my daughter, who's learned a lot from snare robotics, is the concept of emotional labor, which is a new concept that is being pursued by a number of researchers. And I believe that. She, in fact, intends to share with her colleagues. And it is exactly at the core of what we are discussing, that certain people in certain professions, their emotion is commodified. They are expected, they are paid for that additional emotion. For example, someone who's... Or not paid, or paid very little. For example, someone who's taking care of the elderly, it's not only that the person knows how to vaccinate or whatever, or give a medicine, but also their emotion, it's expected that they're putting in their feeling, as you said, more than a manager might be doing in a factory or whatever. So the concept of emotional labor, I think, is very much linked to what we have been discussing about care. Thank you. I think there was someone else's hand up. Thank you. You yours. Just uh, very quickly, I think any any valuation, uh, be it in labor or environment, it needs to be accompanied by very clear physical indicators. Uh, for example, when one values coral reefs, uh, if there is no market, then there is no value. Is that the case? Uh, 
Um, that is not the case. But I think you have to give a clear physical indicator, such as, for example, condition A and condition B contributes to productivity in the fisheries by how much. Things like that. And um, personally, I think the dollar value itself doesn't matter as much as the articulation of these physical indicators. And I'm very interested to hear about this emotional labor. It's another new term for me, so thank you. <laughs> I just have to tell you a little story about emotional labor. Um, I don't know if any of you have heard of Nyla Kabir. Have you heard of Nyla Kabir? Yes. Nyla Kabir was my, one of my PhD supervisors, and I was her only PhD supervisor for many years because she was told early on that when she was going to be a PhD supervisor, she had to give some maternal love and care, and she said to the other person who said this to her, Nyla Kabir is a very strong woman. <laughs> Me, I haven't got a maternal bone in my body. <laughs> so she would never supervise a PhD student. She didn't want to do the emotional labor at all. I yes, love that yes. story. It reminds me very much uh, when you said that. How did you go with it? Um, I passed, yeah. But she didn't, she wasn't very <laughs> supervised. <laughs> she, uh, after I submitted it, she hadn't read it. And later on, about a year later, she said, oh, I read your thesis, very good. <laughs>